Hi friends, you are back with me, uh, Professor Gilesh Pokreja. Today, what we will talk about is some preliminary uh, like steps which uh, take place during the fixation of uh, nitrogen. In our earlier videos, we have talked about the nitrogen cycle and one of the primary events which brings this nitrogen into the uh, organic world, from the inorganic world, is the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, probably only bacteria are blessed with the ability to fix the atmospheric nitrogen in this entire biosphere. Uh, where we have so much of biodiversity of plants, animals and microbes, it is only certain cyanobacteria, certain archaebacteria and certain eubacteria which are bestowed upon this quality of fixing the atmospheric nitrogen. Only they can take the atmospheric nitrogen which is present in the atmosphere in the form of N2 and convert it into ammonia. Now soil bacteria as I told in the earlier nitrogen cycle, they are not going to leave that ammonia as it is. They are going to get converted into nitrites and nitrate. But whatever, if all your uh, biosphere requirements, uh, they are being fulfilled by these particular bacteria. Yes. So your plants will take from these particular, uh, this particular soil, then your animals will take from this particular plants. Anyways, uh, today we are not going to discuss the nitrogen cycle. We are going to discuss some preliminary steps in the nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen, like N2, combining of this N2 with hydrogen to form ammonia, uh, bioenergetically speaking, like if you talk about the delta G0 prime of this particular reaction, the reaction is exergonic, like it, it is like around minus uh, 33.5 kilojoule per mole. So it seems that uh, this reaction is spontaneous and it will like uh, take place immediately, but then we know in biogenetics, uh, bioenergetics it only tells whether the reaction will take place or not. Tune into some other videos where we have discussed various concepts of bioenergetics. So basically though this reaction is exergonic but N triple bond N like I think uh, one of the stable molecules uh, which is present in the biosphere. If you talk about the uh, energy that would be required to break this N triple bond N that would be around 930 kilojoule per mole. A lot amount of energy and therefore probably this remains stable. So though this particular uh, molecule and this particular formation is exergonic, the molecule remains quite stable because the activation energy that would be required to break this N triple bond N would be very high. And this probably you must have seen when uh, we are preparing this ammonia artificially in the industries. We, we do this, right? Humans have like made uh, many impossible things possible and now there are many possible things which are uh, becoming impossible. Anyways, <laughs> that is not the point of discussion. So the Haber's process, the uh, very good old Haber's process discovered by Fritz Haber, where they convert this atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia at say around 400 to 500 degrees Celsius at several uh, hundreds of thousands of kilopascals of your uh, pressure to several hundred of atmospheres of your pressure. So very high temperature and a very high pressure would be required to convert this nitrogen into ammonia in your industries. But this is what your uh, microorganisms are doing uh, at normal temperatures and pressures. And I always say that you are not going to put the bags of urea and ammonia into the forest and uh, they, like, they, they, the nitrogen there uh, from where they are getting. So they are getting from uh, these particular bacteria. And we are well aware that bacteria do this at normal temperatures and pressures. So at normal temperature, at a pressure of around say 0.8 atmospheres, your bacteria are easily fixing this particular atmospheric nitrogen. So if we talk about atmospheric nitrogen fixation, uh, which is being done by these particular bacteria, the biochemical equation goes this way, like your nitrogen with your protons, with your electrons, it requires 16 molecules of your ATP. So if the bacteria is going to do it at normal temperatures and pressures, it is going to do it at the cost of ATP. So fixation of one molecule of nitrogen is going to require 16 molecules of your ATP and then you are going to get your ammonium ion. So a very costly process. Bacteria won't do it if you provide it with a fixed nitrogen. Anyone won't do it, right? Energetically, a very costly affair to fix this particular atmospheric nitrogen. How the bacteria, they accomplish this? They accomplish this with the help of a complex what you call as uh, enzymes which we call as the nitrogenase complex, not as complex as the name is. <laughs> so nitrogenase complex when we are talking about, we have two uh, again components here. It has a dinitrogenase reductase with a molecular weight of around 60,000 and a dinitrogenase component which has a molecular weight of around 240,000. Now this particular enzyme, dinitrogenase reductase is a dimer, it has two identical subunits with these ion sulfur centers which can transfer one electron at a time and this is the place where your ATP is going to bind. So it is a dimer, identical subunits, going to take electrons, 
one at a time and going to bind two molecules of the ATP. So it has two binding sites for ATP, uh, one on each subunit. So it has two subunits. So each subunit is going to bind your ATP or later ADP after its hydrolysis. The dihydrogenase component here is a tetramer which has two copies of uh, two different subunits. So say you have two A and B, so two molecules of A and two molecules of B, so total four subunits. And this particular tetramer is more complex. I'm not going into the chemistry of this much. Probably we'll tune into some another video for more complex and detailed mechanisms of how it happens. As I told, this is a superficial overview of how the electrons they are being passed when your nitrogen is being reduced. Yeah. So this is a ion molybdenum center. Whenever we are talking about uh, isolating the organisms which are fixing atmospheric nitrogen, you will find that we uh, specifically take care of the medium it contains molybdenum. So uh, uh, element which would be required uh, by this nitrogenase complex for fixation of this atmospheric nitrogen. So this is the ion molybdenum center. So it contains two molybdenum, 32 ion and 30 sulfurs uh, in one tetramer. So huge requirement. So uh, overall the process seems to be very complex and requires a good deal of uh, what we call as cofactors and metals and other things, right? So uh, this is how uh, your dihydrogen is going to do. So instead of uh, molybdenum, certain species of bacteria have been known to uh, use vanadium. Though we have uh, very less information, now we have much anyway. Uh, uh, but the information which we have with the molybdenum containing nitrogen is much more. So exactly uh, what happens, you know, the highly reduced form of dihydrogenase is the ultimate source of electron for reducing your nitrogen to your ammonia. So it is going to require 8 electrons. So once this dihydrogenase has got all the 8 electrons, it will use the 6 of these to convert your nitrogen into ammonia and 2 of these to convert your H plus into H2. Formation of hydrogen is like uh, say uh, a compulsory, a mandatory reaction which takes place when there is uh, fixation of this particular nitrogen. So that nitrogen is, is going to transfer these electrons to nitrogen and to H plus, where your nitrogen would be converted to ammonia and your H plus would be converted into your H2. The ultimate source of electrons to this dihydrogen is, is your dihydrogen is reductase. And this dihydrogen is reductase may have uh, varied uh, what you call as uh, sources of your electron. Like it may have a reduced pelidoxin, it may have a reduced ferroflavodoxin, and these in turn will get from different components. Like here we have taken the example of one of the species which uses pyruvate as the ultimate source of the electron. So pyruvate is oxidized to your acetyl CoA, electrons are released, and one at a time, as I told, that it is this dihydrogen is reductase which carries electron one at a time. So your flavodoxin or peridoxin molecules which were in the oxidized state now, they are now reduced. So the electrons they are transferred from pyruvate to acetyl coa uh, not from pyruvate to acetyl coa uh, while going from pyruvate to acetyl coa electrons were released. These were captured by the peridoxin or flavodoxin which was present in the oxidized form. This get, gets converted into the reduced form. This now acts as the uh, donor of the electron for our dihydrogenase reductase. This one at a time, as I told. We will take the electrons and once it has taken the electron, this reduced form is going to bind ATP. So by transferring one electron, it is going to bind two ATP. This is a dimer. So it is a dimer, so it is going to have two sides of binding of ATP. Now ATP here we know that it serves purpose by different ways, by providing the energy after its hydrolysis, by just simple binding. Here it does like one more thing, like after the binding and uh, even after the hydrolysis, you will find that there is a change in the conformation of this dihydrogenase reductase. This dihydrogenase reductase, after binding to this particular ATP and after its hydrolysis, you will find there is a conformational change in this dihydrogenase reductase and it what you call as shifts its E0 prime value from minus 300 uh, millivolts to your minus 420 millivolts. So earlier it was minus 300, now it is minus 420. Again, go back to bioenergetics where we told that uh, more negative is your E0 value, uh, better donor of the electron it is. More positive is the E0 value, better acceptor of the electron it is. So here, this becomes now more negative, right? So minus 300 to minus 420. So it becomes a more good reducing agent. So it will now donate the electrons to your dihydrogenase one at a time. So this dihydrogenase will take the electron. So once one electron has come, two molecules of ATP have bound. Now this transfer is of eight electrons. So in total, I will hydrolyze around 60 molecules of ATP. 
I won't hydrolyze it, bacteria will hydrolyze it. <laughs> so, this 16 volt plus of ATP, 8 electrons, one by one, get it transferred to your dianhydrogen. Now, this dianhydrogen is tetramer, it is now completely converted into its reduced form. So, this reduced form then transfers into nitrogen. So, a uh, quick summary from pyruvate, electrons transferred to peridoxin, peridoxin or flavodoxin from oxidized went to the reduced form. One by one, dianhydrogen is it will become, donate the electron, hydrolyze the ATP, become a good reducing agent, go back, again accept the electron, again find the ATP, become a good reducing agent, donate the electron, again go back. So, it has these two sides for binding of this dianhydrogen is it takes. So, this is how it happens, and once this is completely reduced, this will transfer the electrons to our nitrogen converting up N2 into ammonia. This is what we wanted to do, right? One major problem which this entire mechanism faces is that of oxygen. We all love oxygen, <laughs> but this doesn't. So we all are uh, like we 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 uh, study of this oxygen as uh, uh, the gas which gives life. <laughs> but here, uh, this gas is not good for this. So reductase you will find has a half life of around 30 seconds in air. Your dianhydrogen is it has half life for around 10 minutes. So once oxygen is in the picture, the entire process is like totally gone. So many of the bacteria, most of the bacteria, all of the bacteria, which are actually uh, what you call is uh, performing this uh, nitrogen uh, fixation, they have to be very careful with this particular oxygen. So many of these species, what they do is they do perform this entire process anaerobically. So there is no oxygen, so there is no question. <laughs> But then some of them, uh, what they do is that when they are living aerobically, they will not fix the nitrogen. They cannot do both together. Because oxygen is going to be a major hindrance because this entire system of nitrogen is, is completely labile of oxygen. So once the oxygen enters in the picture, the entire thing is gone. So you have certain examples like we have bacteria like uh, Azinobacter velendi. This particular bacteria has a separate bypass which uncouples your electrons from ATP. So as soon as the oxygen enters, the electrons they go to this particular uh, oxygen and uh, they literally burn off the oxygen before it enters the cell. And therefore the temperature it increases. So if, if you really look at the test tube where uh, this bacteria is fixing the atmospheric nitrogen, you will find that the temperature is really increasing. You will find this uh, particular problem being circumvented in different ways. Like one of the famous examples whenever you are talking about nitrogen fixation is of uh, leguminous plants. So here you have species of uh, bacteria, uh, they form root nodules, like you have different species of say rhizobium which are forming these root nodules. Uh, they uh, like solve both the problem, uh, two things, one is energy, a lot of energy is going to be required and your oxygen. Both these problems are solved when this uh, rhizobium or these uh, root nodule kind of uh, bacteria are present in the root nodule and they are fixing the atmospheric nitrogen there. So, how do they do this? Like what, what they will do is uh, the carbohydrates or the citric acid cycle intermediates which are present. These citric acid cycle intermediate and carbohydrates will be an instant supply of energy for these particular bacteria. So therefore you will find the, uh, the cousins of these particular bacteria which are living freely in the soil, they will not fix the nitrogen. But hundreds of times more nitrogen will be fixed by these bacteria which are present in the root nodules. And another major problem of your oxygen, uh, they counteract by uh, producing leg hemoglobin, a molecule which is uh, like produced only when they are in association. Most of the part will be produced by the plant, uh, your uh, heme part may be contributed by the bacteria, so they can come together and they will form this leg hemoglobin. And this leg hemoglobin will scavenge all the oxygen from the parts wherever uh, what you call as uh, nitrogen fixation is taking place and uh, properly take it to the place where electron transfers are taking place so that the electron transfer and nitrogen fixation both uh, they go hand in hand. So probably uh, organisms are evolved in that way. They are getting food. Plant obviously is benefited because it is going to get this fixed nitrogen. Probably that has led us to uh, formation of uh, crop rotation where you have taken a crop like maize which is going to extract all the nitrogen from the soil. You fix it with some uh, what you call as uh, rotate it with some uh, plantlings of leguminous plants where root nodules will be formed. The lost nitrogen would be restored and again you take a plant which is going to extract that nitrogen. And now with advancement in technology, what we are trying to do is we are going to put this particular nitrogen fixing complexes we are trying to put in some other bacteria and also we are trying to put uh, these particular genes coding for this nitrogenase complex uh, directly into the plants. So there are many things coming up. Yes, so we will have many more things uh, coming up when uh, we are talking about nitrogen fixation. As I told, this video was just an overview. So you have a question there that uh, how cyanobacteria like your nostoc anabina which are 
fixing atmosphere in nitrogen how they circumvent this particular problem of your oxygen so do let me know that how these cyanobacteria they take care of uh, the oxygen toxicity of this nitrogenous complex and stay tuned with me professor girish kutreja for more in biochemistry metabolism and much more i know that this video was a quick uh, bit faster uh, but then i hope that you will uh, enjoy thank you so much